Republicans have been the minority party in the Oregon legislature for years, which means they don't have a lot of power unless they walk out to prevent a vote. I have been informed, Madam Secretary, that the Republicans will not be coming to the floor. But a group wants to put a stop to that tactic with a new ballot measure. So if you don't show up to work, if you no call, no show to your job 10 times in a row, there's no way you would get to keep your job. Plus, we're visiting the least populated place in Washington, Protection Island. Population, one. The fact that I would end up being the only person here, I, I could have never dreamed that up in a million years. Here's the story. Hey there, I'm Ashley Korslund in for Pat Doris tonight. Welcome to the story. All the ways to get in touch with us, by the way, are at the bottom of the screen. You can email us at the story at KGW.com. Use the hashtag the story KGW on Twitter or just leave us a voicemail. You can call our number 503-226-5090. Okay, let's get to our big story now. Oregon lawmakers are out of session right now and won't meet again until January. But things haven't been so smooth in the legislature over the last several years. Do you remember all those Republican walkouts? Well, a group is trying to prevent those from happening again. Now, before we get into that, let's make sure we are all on the same page. So how did we get here? In 2019, Republicans didn't show up for work to keep Democrats from voting on a bill aimed at reducing carbon emissions called cap and trade. You might remember the big rallies involving log trucks at the state capitol. Loggers and farmers were worried cap and trade would affect their fuel prices and their jobs. It was a bold move, but Republicans had seen it work before a month earlier when they used the same tactic and got Democrats to scrap gun control and vaccine bills. These walkouts work because Democrats have the majority in both the House and Senate. And if they all agree on something, then there's nothing the GOP can do to stop it. Unless they stop the vote entirely, which is what a walkout does. If there aren't enough lawmakers present to vote, they don't have a quorum, meaning no one can vote. In 2020, Republicans walked out again when Democrats took another run at cap and trade. To be fair, Republicans didn't invent this move. Democrats have pulled it themselves. They walked out over a redistricting bill in 2001 when Republicans had the majority. Now, Governor Kate Brown was the Senate Democratic leader at the time and was part of organizing it. The only thing that can stop a walkout is a two-thirds supermajority when the state elects so many people from one party that they can make a quorum without the other party even showing up. Democrats would need to gain several more seats this November to reach that two-thirds mark. But a group called Hold Politicians Accountable just submitted enough signatures to get a new initiative on the ballot. It would disqualify any lawmaker with 10 or more unexcused absences from running for re-election. And that's how we got here. All right, so now that we're caught up, we can tell you this. This afternoon, we talked to a spokesperson from the group, Hold Politicians Accountable. They got more than 183,000 signatures for their initiative petition. That's way over the threshold needed to get something on the ballot. And that has them feeling pretty optimistic. It's the most signatures that any measure has ever turned in in Oregon. Um, right now, it's with the Secretary of State's office. They have several weeks to verify all the signatures and make sure that they are from registered voters. Um, we expect that to be done in the next couple of weeks, uh, at which point we'll really start kind of reengaging the campaign. Yeah, she po also pointed to a poll from last year that found 84% of Oregon voters are in favor of punishing lawmakers who walk out by disqualifying them from the next election. And 78% said they also support fining those lawmakers or just taking away their salaries. I think it's just really intuitive for people like they understand the premise of if you don't show up to work, if you no call, no show to your job 10 times in a row, there's no way you would get to keep your job. And I think people are really sick of politicians who think they can play by their own rules um, and want them to be held to the same standard, if not the higher, higher standard than the rest of us. We elect them to do a job and um, the least they can do is, you know, follow their oath of office and do the constitutional duties that are required of them. She says they have not encountered any big opposition groups to their ballot measure just yet, but Republican lawmakers likely are not in favor of it. In the past, they've said they've had no other option than to walk out and have framed the tactic as a protest to stick up for their constituents. 
Now to a story with no clear ending. It's an unsolved mystery. 12 years ago, a boy named Kyron Horman disappeared from Skyline School in Northwest Portland. The second grader has never been found. Over the years, the case has been the focus of countless news stories and has generated plenty of speculation. So let's bring in Kylie Boshi, who has been covering this case from day one. Now, Kyle, first, you and I know this story, but others may not, so give us a little background. Yeah, it was 12 years ago, June 4th, 2010. We got word late in the day that a little boy was missing. He disappeared from Skyline School. Now, at the time, most of us figured, well, he'll probably be found. Maybe the second grader just wandered off or went to a friend's house, but that wasn't the case. And soon, there were all kinds of people out looking for him in the high grass and the wooded areas surrounding Skyline School in Northwest Portland. It would eventually become Oregon's largest search effort. The FBI was involved along with local police, but they never found him or any evidence. Yeah, and I assume, Kyle, that police are still investigating, right? Yeah, they are, um, although things have been pretty quiet in the past year or so. This weekend, investigators released new age progression images showing what Kyron might look like as a 17-year-old. Also, his mother, Desiree Young, she held a press conference. She's not giving up. No matter how many years I've been up here, it never gets any easier. making the drive in for 12 years and pulling up to the school and knowing that this is the last place Kyron was. I can't even explain the anguish and the heartache and how that feels to be here 12 years later. I just... In 12 years without answers. Now, there's never been an arrest in this case, but Kyron's mom thinks she knows who's responsible. She blames the missing boy's stepmother, Terry Horman. Terry took Kyron to school that day and is the last known person to see him. She's long denied any wrongdoing and has since moved to California and also remarried. And Kyle, I know one question that people often ask is why this case? You know, there are hundreds of missing kids in the state of Oregon. Why has this one, though, attracted so much attention? Yeah, I think this case stands out for a couple of reasons. The biggest, really the circumstances here. This was a little boy who disappeared from school. That just doesn't happen, or it's extremely rare. And honestly, the story itself has had so many odd twists and turns over the years. If you want to read about it, go to KGW.com or just Google Kyron Horman. I mean, there have been TV shows about it, a book, countless news stories. At the end of the day, though, this little boy, he's still missing. Twelve years later, we don't know what happened to Kyron Horman. Yeah. Kyle, thank you. Okay, I know we have a lot of people watching from rural areas. Well, tonight we're going to take you to one of the most rural parts of Washington. It's a tiny island with just one resident, a man who's lived there for more than 50 years. Eric Wilkinson has his story. And, yeah, that's, name of the game here is load stuff and unload stuff. When I take my boat, I don't need to move so much stuff because everything's in the boat. So that does make it easier. Life can be complicated when you live on a deserted island, especially when your boat sank last winter. Well, that's the thing about the island. I mean, it is kind of a paradise here, and I'm, and I'm getting things where it's a real nice livable place, but if something does go wrong, it can go real wrong. It's uh, been really inconvenient, but Joe saved the day by, you know, bringing us over in his boat. <laughs> he is a man who is an island unto himself. Perfect job there, Skipper. <clears throat> Welcome to Fantasy Island. <laughs> I am Marty Bluewater. I'm, this is hard to say, 73 years old. We are now on Protection Island. Marty, how long have you lived here? I bought the, uh, uh, the lot in 1971. 51 years ago, Marty and his parents paid $7,000 for a vacation property on Protection Island, just off Port Townsend. It was supposed to be a huge development with 1,000 homes, but then environmentalists requested the island be designated as a national wildlife refuge, which Marty supported, but his family had already purchased the land. After a long legal battle, the family was offered a settlement, and with it, the opportunity of a lifetime. <sighs> this is a good day. We should have brought the margaritas, though. He could stay on the island for the rest of his life. At the time, I thought, well, 
life use, whatever that means, I'm taking it. The fact that I would end up being the only person here, I, I could have never dreamed that up in a million years. <laughs> okay, we'll go do a little tour here. A retired Seattle Parks worker and Woodland Park Zoo manager, Marty spends his days far from the rat race of city life. <clears throat> this is some heavy wood. I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> so this is what I use for heat. The closest thing to a traffic jam is a flock of seagulls on an unpaved road. After more than half a century here, he is one with nature. You know, now I kind of feel like I'm just another one of the creatures running around. So this would be my little nest. Still under construction. The big thing was when we finally got a toilet in there to actually flush the toilet. That was like a, a big momentous time here. Whew, it's getting a little breezy. What I spend on AA and AAA batteries a year is ridiculous. <laughs> Thank God for Costco. Marty has no electricity. Everything runs on batteries or solar power. His water comes from a well powered by a generator. Propane heats that water, providing Marty with one of his greatest indulgences. I could count the, probably on one, two hands, maybe no more than twice, how many times I've used the inside shower. I use this all the time. I've cut snowed out here in the snow and middle of the night. Sometimes if it's a little clear, starry night, I'll come out here and just take a shower just for the heck of it. If his boat isn't running, friends ferry Marty to the mainland for supplies. Those friends, a critical connection to the rest of the world. Does it ever get lonely out here? No, uh, that doesn't usually happen. I mean, it's so easy for me to come and go, and then I've got so many friends that, that, that come, so that when I'm here by myself, it's usually, uh, you know, because uh, I want to be here by myself. But island life does carry its concerns. Last summer, this fire broke out that threatened all Marty has worked for, and eagles are threatening the seabird population of the island. That's a problem for two reasons. One, just because you don't want the seabirds to be endangered and you want to protect the place like it is. But two, also, they broke a lot of hearts and took away this land from a lot of people and to preserve it as a seabird sanctuary. So you can't just let the eagles come over and take it and destroy that as much as we all love eagles. I just feel blessed that somehow I got to be a big part of it. Marty Bluewater has planted his flag on this obscure rock, the last human to ever inhabit this deserted island. When he dies, the land becomes federal property. And while they say no man is an island, if an island could be a man, this one would be Marty Bluewater. I'm probably caring more about this island than, than anybody, and that will never change. Right there, it makes me feel like I'm home. Portland has a housing crisis. The most obvious solution is to build more places to live. And the city council just passed new rules to allow more townhouses, duplexes, and triplexes. But it will actually shape the direction, the physical direction of this city for decades to come. And later. Traveling back to the 1963 Junior Rose Festival Parade in the KGW Vault, when the story continues. Hey, welcome back. Keep sending your questions and your comments to the story at KGW.com or give us a call and leave a voicemail at 503-226-5090. A new episode of KGW's true crime podcast, Should Be Alive, comes out this Wednesday. The podcast examines the 2019 murder of a Vancouver teenager named Nikki Kuhnhausen. Her killer strangled Nikki after finding out that she was transgender during a sexual encounter. You can listen to Should Be Alive wherever you get your podcasts. There are six episodes altogether. We will release a new one each Wednesday. We also have photos, videos, and much more information about Nikki's case at kgw.com slash should be alive. We go now to the city of Portland's plan to get more people into housing. The plan, unanimously approved by city council, calls for high density housing in the city's residential neighborhoods. As Mike Benner reports, this is all part of Portland's two phase residential infill project. The lack of affordable housing for middle class families is really the driving force behind all of this. The latest phase of the residential infill project will give people a chance to live in neighborhoods they'd typically be priced out of. 
When it comes to living in Portland, there are a number of perks. Many will argue accessibility to housing is not one of them, and city leaders are well aware of that. Newer homes are larger, more expensive, and, and out of reach of most Portlanders. Morgan Tracy is the project manager for the Residential Infill Project, or RIP for short. We saw the first phase of the project come to fruition in August 2020. That's when Portland City Council passed an ordinance allowing for more middle housing in the Rose City's residential neighborhoods. Middle housing is housing opportunities that aren't apartments or single family homes. RIP 1 really looked at uh, opening up what were formerly exclusively single dwelling zones and allowing things like duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes um, while also controlling the size of those structures. If you like the sound of that, then listen to this. Just last week, city commissioners signed off on RIP 2. This allows developers to build even higher density housing in single dwelling zones in Portland. For instance, multifamily units in a single structure, townhomes in what are called cottage clusters. Cottage clusters are multiple detached, smaller units built around or oriented toward a, a common green space. In other words, more housing and home ownership opportunities for more people. Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler calls it the exact right strategy to pursue as a community. At first blush, this can look like pretty dry land use policy, but it will actually shape the direction, the physical direction of this city for decades to come. But without question, there will be critics who say high density housing in areas zoned for single family homes is not the answer to our housing crisis, to which Morgan Tracy says, don't be afraid. It'll happen incrementally and over time. Uh, it's not gonna be a, a, a a wave of, of instant change it'll happen as as those sites become available and that can all start as soon as july 1st when this emergency ordinance goes into effect and because all of this is so convoluted the city's bureau of development services is hosting a rip to lunch and learn presentation next week for more on that you can head to our website kgw.com i'm mike benner now back to you all right, we love keeping Portland weird on this show because why not? And this is pretty weird. I think Shakespeare himself would love people doing his tragedies with puppets. Yeah, I bet you've never seen Shakespeare quite like this before. That's when the story continues. Like Portland Theater Company is taking on one of Shakespeare's most violent tragedies, telling the gruesome tale of revenge through sock puppets. Isn't that so, Portland? Brittany Falkers has a look at how this production is keeping Portland weird. You know, Shakespeare is not untouchable. And when you think of Shakespeare, this... She thinks me mad. ...probably Hark isn't villains. what you had in mind. Hark, villains! Enter Portland's Canon Shakespeare Company. I think Shakespeare himself would love people doing his tragedies with puppets. Their new show, Titus and Darnicus, a sock puppet play, is now showing online. It's a project two years in the making that started in the early days of the pandemic when theaters closed. And it was all just gone. So um, we were all feeling a little bit lost. But Stephanie Crowley had one big, albeit kooky idea to help. And I said, you know what I really want to do? I want to do Titus Andronicus with sock puppets. And everybody laughed, but I really wasn't joking. No, she was not. And managing director Alec Henenberger was all in. Give Shakespeare a little less gravity. No bull patrician. Take him from his pedestal. Of Take him from the ivory right. tower that's Defend sort of taking him from the, the people. Of my taking him from normal people. Treason, my lord. Lavinia is surprised. They did the whole thing remote. Five actors playing Surprise. all the parts, recording their scenes at home. I made 39 sock puppets and all of their associated miniature props. We all had green screens and she dropped in backgrounds, which were actually drawn by the four-year-old daughter of one of our actors. The show is a darkly hilarious 90-minute sock puppet version of Shakespeare's bloodiest revenge play, Titus Andronicus. Set in the Roman Empire, a general returns from war with prisoners who vow to take revenge against him. And that leads to... A cycle of revenge that gets bloodier and bloodier and more 
ridiculously over the top as it goes. Yeah, I mean, the language he wrote about, yeah, that's an honest hurdle. And when you're performing, you have to know that. It was written 400 years ago. People don't talk the same way as they did back then. But what he wrote about love, betrayal, honor, country, politics, all of that is very real and very accessible today. Hoping to make it even more accessible, Puppet. You are my guest, Lavinia, and your friends. And this while Titus Andarnicus be. is deliberately very funny and a little slapstick, a lot of it is very real as well. What mattered most was that we got a team full of people through some pretty tough times by just having some fun together with a really stupid, ridiculous idea. Oh yeah, keep in Portland weird, one sock puppet at a time. All right, keep sending your questions and your comments to the story at KJW.com. We will finish the show with a trip into the KJW vaults right after this. It is Rose Festival season and the Junior Rose Parade is happening this week. So we thought it would be fun to pull a clip of that same parade out of the KJW vault from all the way back in 1963. It was hosted by longtime KJW anchor and reporter Ivan Smith. And from our rooftop here at uh, Public Finance, we're directly across from the Queens reviewing stand for the Junior Rose Festival Parade. Public address announcer is just asking the children to clear away. She's been besieged with autograph seekers. Queen Linda II from Grand High and all the royal court in the realm of Rose area. Also in the reviewing is the attractive Yoko Yumamoto, 19, Miss Sapporo, Japan, our sister city, who is here taking a bow right now, who is here to uh, participate in the Rose Festival ceremonies as the sister city of Portland, Oregon, in Japan. Queen Linda II giving us a big wave as our first motorcycle escorts come into view. And your 1963 Junior Rose Fest Parade is well underway. Their theme is highlights in history, as is the Senior Rose Parade. Our dignitaries coming in full form in beautiful white convertibles. How cool is that? I love going back into the vault. All right, for this week's Hey Help campaign, we are asking you to donate to Because People Matter. It's a Portland nonprofit that holds an event called Night Strike each week for people experiencing homelessness. Every Thursday night under the Burnside Bridge, the group offers hot meals, haircuts, clothing, shoes, and sleeping bags. If you'd like to help out, just hold your phone's camera right up to that QR code that's on your screen, or you can head to kgw.com slash hey help. And this is just a micro donation drive. That means you can give any amount that you can, no matter how small it makes a difference. Well, that's the end of our show. Thanks for watching the news at 630 starts.